and after the course. All right, so let's get started. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Sarah Finkelday from um, UC Irvine, who will be speaking today about complex oxides in the nuclear fuel cycle, new activities at UC Irvine. Um, and Professor Sarah Finkelday studied chemistry at RWTH Aachen and studied py uh, pyrochloroxides as potential nuclear waste forms during her PhD at the Institute of Nuclear Waste Management at the Helmholtz Research Center, Julich, Germany. She received her PhD with honors from the RWTH Aachen University in 2014. During her time as a postdoctoral researcher in the Helmholtz Center in Julich, she led a collaborative project with Professor Ra Ewing from Stanford University and Professor Mike Lang from Eugene Knoxville on the long-term matrix composition, uh, ma sorry, on the long-term matrix corrosion of spent nuclear fuel. In August 20, 2017, she joined the Nuclear Fuel Materials Group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory as a postdoctoral researcher and worked under the supervision of Dr. Kurt Tarani and Dr. Andrew Nelson for the Advanced Fuels Campaign of DOE. In July 2019, Professor Finkelday joined the Department of Chemistry at UC Irvine as an assistant professor, where her research interests span from advanced nuclear forms to nuclear waste forms. So with that, um, Sarah, please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Let me quickly share my screen. Um, Um, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can see it and it's in presentation mode and we can see your pointer. Very you can. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, thanks for inviting me and um, yeah, it's my pleasure to tell you about the research um, that I've been uh, performing over the last couple of years. And as I said before, this is going to be a little bit more of an overview about the research on complex oxides in the nuclear fuel cycle context. And um, if there's any topic that interests you in particular, feel free to like interrupt me or to, to ask me in the end. Okay, so um, as a uh, Raluca already said, um, my, my background is so I'm a chemist by training. I was born and studied in Aachen um, and I worked on pyrochloroxides, um, these so-called A2, B2, or 7 oxides um, in the nuclear waste management context. And um, I studied those materials um, for um, as their potential use as a nuclear waste form. And the questions that we were very interested in studying were consequences of radionuclide uptake as well as the long-term performance um, in a nuclear repository. So when we have a deep geological repository where we um, dispose radio material, uh, radioactive materials in a potential ceramic waste form, it's not that we have a ceramic jar and we pour the waste inside, but it's that we um, really want them to be structurally uptaken as this image here indicates to store them safely with all the different um, barriers in a deep geological um, underground repository. So um, after my PhD, I stayed in ULIC at the Helmholtz Center, which is pretty much kind of this similar to a national lab in the United States. And I spent there um, some time and worked, uh, led a project on UO2 model systems for spent nuclear fuel. And we were in particular looking at the role of fission products on the performance in a waste repository. So I had not planned to talk about this topic today, but if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. And um, then when I joined three years ago, Oak Ridge as a postdoc, um, I decided that it was not only time to change countries and continents, but also time to hop from the back end of the fuel cycle to the front end of the fuel cycle. And I studied um, enhanced safety and performance of uranium dioxide-based fuels with um, Dr. Kurt Tarani and Dr. Andrew Nelson. 
And one year ago, I would say I probably started the biggest adventure so far, which was when I joined UCI, um, where I'm combining the research on the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle and at the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. So we do not have a nuclear engineering department at UCI. So um, my group is uh, kind of like the, the home of my group is in the chemistry department at the University of California, Irvine. And um, I'm leading the nuclear chemistry group there. And we have um, materials chemistry laboratories. Um, at the moment, we are in temporary space, but I'm really excited. And so is my group about our uh, new lab spaces that are supposed to be ready in April, where we will have um, fuel and waste from fabrication capabilities, as well as characterization equipment for um, red specimens. And one thing that's probably um, the most unique about UCI is that we do have a trigger research reactor, um, so we can perform in-house irradiations of samples. And we also do have an reactor uh, operator course that our students um, can take if they're interested in, in doing so and become NRC licensed reactor operators. So this is just about um, a few facts about the reactor. It's a 250 kilowatts reactor. Um, and um, we mainly utilize it for neutron activation analysis or for materials irradiation and testing. It has also been um, highly utilized for radiation detector characterization and testing in the past. And if you're interested um, in learning more about the reactor and about the different um, specimen locations where you can irradiate samples in, I would just um, invite you to check the page out um, at the link that I put down on the slide here. Okay, so when we're talking about all the, the nuclear fuel cycle, um, basically the two areas that our research is located at is at the um, front end and at the back end, where we have the complex oxides um, at the front end when we are talking about nuclear fuel forms and potential nuclear fuel forms um, with enhanced properties, and at the back end, um, which could either be the direct disposal of spent fuel as well as potential ceramic waste forms. So let's dive into the topic of um, ceramic waste forms. Whenever we are talking about, in general, nuclear waste disposal, um, our aim is a very safe disposal um, of those materials. And the main um, route that we are following is direct disposal of spent nuclear fuel. And um, besides direct disposal of spent nuclear fuel, there's two alternative ways. Um, for certain waste streams or certain elements, which is the vitrification in, for example, borosilicate glasses. And another opportunity is um, to fabricate ceramic waste forms to embed a certain waste stream or to embed a very specific radionuclide safely for deep geological disposal. And when we are talking about ceramics, um, it started with a synroc, which is a polyphase material, which is the abbreviation for synthetic rock which was developed at uh, the Australian Nuclear and Science Technology Organization um, in Lucas Heights, close to Sydney. And um, when we are talking about single phase materials, we are really aiming to tailor fabricate a waste form for a specific um, nuclide or a specific waste stream. And the material my research is mainly dedicated to is um, a complex oxide, a so-called pyrochloroxide, which is a fluoride type structure derivative. So when we think about innovative nuclear waste forms, um, it is very well known that those have very exceptional properties, but we are still um, not completely there that we have understood everything. So we wanna understand the phenomena and the interdependencies, and we wanna be able to predict capabilities. Um, so that is required in terms to um, predict the safe disposal in a potential ceramic waste form in a deep geological repository. And these predictive capabilities are still fairly limited. And therefore we have to understand like in depth about order disorder phenomena in those materials about radionuclide uptake, the chemical stability. We need to understand radiation resistance and response. And um, therefore we need a couple of new experimental techniques and also a combination of experimental research with computational approaches has been proven very useful. Um, to get a more holistic understanding about the waste form performance of, in this case, pyrochlor um, waste form candidates. So this is basically the research in a nutshell that I'm going to talk about for the next couple of minutes. Um, as I said, when we have 
And when we are embedding a radionuclide, it does not stop the, um, the decay reactions uh, to occur just because we have embedded the radionuclide in a ceramic waste form. So we need to understand the response of the material to radiation um, or how resistant it is to radiation. We also want to understand where the radionuclides are uptaken. So as I said at the beginning, we don't want to like pour the radionuclides like in a ceramic um, pot, but we really are aiming for a structural uptake of the radionuclides, which we want to understand if that's actually um, feasible for those ceramics. We want to understand chemical stability in a deep geological repository. In the worst case scenario that all our technical barriers would fail, we want to make sure that the radionuclides are still safely um, stored in this waste form. And also the chemical flexibility is of interest to understand how much loading is actually um, possible with those ceramic waste forms of our radionuclide. And of course, we are also interested in the physical properties. So I'm not so sure how familiar all of you are with the pyroclast structure. So I thought I'd spend a minute on um, explaining it a little more in, in detail to you. So I guess most of you are very familiar with the fluoride crystal structure where we have an eightfold coordination of our cation by anions. And then um, these cubes are joined along edges to build up our three-dimensional structure. So if we go ahead and introduce some disorder into the system now by removing one eighth of the oxygens, um, what's going to happen is we will create these in, in as gray cubes depicted um, oxygen vacancies in our material. And if those ones are randomly distributed in the structure, we are talking about a so-called defect fluoride structure. But if we, in this disordered system, if we introduce now again, like a, a degree of order to the system by basically fixing these oxygen vacancies at specific lattice sites, what's going to happen is that we end up with a superstructure, like with a higher ordering structure, which is the so-called pyroclaw structure. And it has then, due to um, the fixation of the oxygen vacancies, we result with, or we end up with two different cationic positions. So we have one cationic position that's eightfold coordinated and another one that's only sixfold coordinated with anions. And this is the A side is, um, is basically, if you remember your chemistry class when you learned about sugars, um, we have like the chair conformation. So think about all these X oxygens forming like this chair where our cation sits in the middle. And then we have at the top and at the bottom, like above and below this chair, we have two more oxygens, which are the so-called Y oxygens that are at sh slightly shorter distances compared to the other oxygens. Um, so this is a scalenohedron type environment is how we would call that. And then we have the six fold coordination of the B cation. And this um, order disorder transition, or basically from an ordered to a disordered structure, is particular of interest if we are thinking about um, putting a zirconate on the B side, because those materials are known to undergo, um, if under irradi or as response to irradiation, they will undergo this order disorder transition. And you can see when you look at the XRD pattern that um, the pyrochlor is a superstructure of a fluoride structure, which is indicated by the with asterisk marked uh, superstructure reflexes in an XRD. So we are interested in this order disorder transition from a pyrochlor to a defect fluoride, um, because as I said, whenever we have um, zirconate based pyrochlors, this is basically the response of um, the material to radiation. And um, we are also interested in this order disorder transition because um, whenever we load our phase with um, um, our waste form with um, an actinide, we are actually obtaining the so-called non-stoichiometric pyrochlores because we will have mixed occupancy at the A or at the B site. And um, the self-irradiation, once we upload a radionuclide and immobilize it in a pyrochlor structure can cause this order disorder transition. And what I've done is um, I realized this by variations just of the A to B ratio. So I replaced part of the A side cation with a B side cation to basically move from a pyrochlor to a defect fluoride structure. Um, so this is a project that was done in collaboration with the University of Sheffield with um, Dr. Martin Stennett and Professor Nina Hyatt. 
And what we did is um, we performed extra D studies and we could see that when we are in the pyrochlor region and in the defect fluoride region, our lattice parameters um, followed the gas rule. And we observed like a gradual change along the order disorder transition. But when we looked in depth with transmission electron microscopy, you can see here some um, pattern for uh, a stoichiometric pyrochlor, which is a neodymium-2, zirconium-2, or 7 pyrochlor. And then you can see this is uh, the pattern for um, a pyrochlor structure where part of the neodymium has been replaced with the zirconium, so with a B-side cation. And in this sample, so much of the neodymium was replaced by zirconium that we actually ended up um, with a disordered structure with a defect fluoride structure. And if we look along different zone axes, what we can see is that actually part of the superstructure reflexes, which we see, are still remaining um, in the defect fluoride structure, whereas along different, uh, different zone axes, all the superstructure reflexes are gone for the defect fluoride structure. So there was an indication that there is kind of a um, order disorder um, transition or that there is like some, some difference on the um, order disorder transition um, at, at different um, length scales going on. So we were looking for a complementary technique to, we, uh, we were looking into a complementary technique to um, gain more insights into that. And I just got a chat note here. So basically, Vigard's rule, which I mentioned here, so Vigard's rule um, predicts uh, when we have, whenever we have a solid solution, it predicts um, a linear dependence of the lattice parameter on our chemical composition of a solid solution. And um, yeah, we can probably see that a little bit later on on another slide as well. So after these results from TEM, we were interested in studying this with a complementary technique. And what we did is uh, we teamed up with the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, with a group of Professor Mike Lang, and we performed neutron total scattering analysis at the Spallation Neutron Source at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, and the neutron total scattering analysis gives us long range order information about our material. And what we did is we also perform pair distribution function analysis. So what we do when we look at this part is we basically are analyzing the diffuse scattering um, that we are collecting. And this provides information about the short range order of the material. And um, we looked at a pyrochlor sample and we looked at a defect fluoride sample for um, with a neutron total scattering analysis and with the um, pair distribution function analysis. So um, this basically enables us to study the heterogeneous disorder along different length scales. So when we looked at a pyrochlor sample, and this is um, a graph that uh, Dr. Yubaraga from Los Alamos drew uh, when he highlighted our Nature Materials article in the News and Views. Um, and I think this is kind of a nice way of explaining it. So for a pyrochlor, we observed from the neutron total scattering as well as from the PDF, we obtained information about a pyrochlor structure. So um, the pyrochlor structure is basically present along all length scales. But when we start like this disordering process and we look at a sample that is by XRD looks like a defect fluoride and by neutron total scattering analysis also looks like a defect fluoride sample, we found with the PDF analysis where we are looking at the short range order, we found um, a higher ordering. So basically this order disorder phenomena um, happens at different um, differently along different length scales. So at the local scale, we obtained Weberite domains. So you can see here the PDF analysis where we tried to fit our um, black data with um, a defect fluoride uh, model. And you can see all the discrepancy in the data. And first my collaborators told me like, Sarah, you just prepared awful samples. Um, so this is just not working out. And then after a while, when we digged a little bit deeper, we found that we can actually describe the data that we collected extremely well on the local um, scale with a Weberite structure model. So what's actually happening is at the local order or at the local range, we are still observing a higher order structure than a defect fluoride structure, 
but at the long range, we are having a more disordered structure, which is a defect right structure. And after these findings, um, which we published in Nature Materials a few years ago, we were interested in um, understanding more about this order disorder transition with the new knowledge that we had just obtained. So what we did is we performed a combined calorimetric and atomistic simulation um, experiment. And that was done together with Professor Alexandra Nabrotsky when she was still at UC Davis before she moved to the ASU. Um, and what we did is we performed high temperature calorimetry measurements at UC Davis. And um, you can see the formation entropy here dependent on the chemical composition of um, a pyrochlor. So you can see an increase in neodymium content basically. So um, over here, you can see the black data points. And sorry, this is a little messy, maybe a little harder to, to see. These are the formation entropies for pyrochlor samples. And once we replace, like once we go backwards on these axes, we basically replace more of the neodymium by zirconium. And that makes us ending up in a defectorite structure. And we could see when we um, performed computation analysis by um, special quasi-random structures, um, we could easily describe our experimental data with um, in the pyrochlor region with a pyrochlor model. But when we tried to describe these three guys here, the defectorite structures, that was not very easily doable with a defectorite structure. And with the knowledge that we obtained, we thought maybe a Weberite would do the job, but you can see that also fit with Weberite structure led to really not a good um, agreement to our experimental data. So what we ended up to do is we basically set up a two-state model of a Weberite and defect right structure. And this is the dashed red line over here. And you can see that this describes fairly well the experimental findings in the defect right um, area and therefore confirmed our findings um, with a pair distribution function analysis that we are actually having different degrees of order in this disordered material. And we were also able to um, basically derive the um, enthalpy at the phase transition, so the enthalpy of disordering to be 30 kilojoules per mole with the calorimetry experiments. Okay, so once we had a pretty good understanding about the structure um, and about the properties of the um, physical properties of the pyrochlor structure, we were actually interested in studying if the actinides can structurally be uptaken by a pyrochlor structure. So what I did is um, I performed luminescence spectroscopy experiments. And the beauty of this technique is that you can really detect trace concentrations. So you can just use 10 ppm of curium in your sample. And um, this technique is sensitive to such low concentrations. Um, and you can then basically probe the local uh, structural environment of your dopant of interest. So what we did is we were able, because if you remember the structure slide I just showed you, the A and the B side of a pyrochlor have different environments. So we could, with um, time-resolved laser fluorescence spectroscopy, determine that curium was actually structurally uptaken on the A side in a pyrochlor. And once we had performed these experiments with um, trace amounts of actinides, I moved towards um, more um, realistic waste forms where we want to have higher waste loadings because um, obviously we don't just want to immobilize 10 ppm of a nuclide of interest that we want to store in, um, or basically immobilize in a waste form because then we would just create tons and tons of waste. And um, for those ones, we have used another characterization techniques technique, which is X-ray absorption spectroscopy, where you can detect higher concentrations, where you can identify the oxidation state of your element of interest, and also get information about the number and bond distance of next neighbor atoms. So what I did is um, I went for quite a while to the Netherlands, to NRG, and uh, developed a synthesis route there to fabricate a plutonium pyrochlor. So this was, I think, the day I was Actually, I succeeded in fabricating the pyrochlor, so that's why I look so happy. Um, we did a co-precipitation um, and performed all temperature uh, or thermal treatments under reducing atmospheres. So um, a year later, when I had export and import licenses from the Netherlands to Germany to ship those samples, 
um, I went back and I actually embedded those samples, so a five more percent and a 10 more percent plutonium doped pyrochlor um, for X-ray absorption spectroscopy analysis because all the equipment that was available on site, like XRD um, and SEM, all showed um, independently um, a structural uptake of the plutonium. So you would not see any plutonium um, segregations in our pellets. And we could also index all of the reflexes with a pyrochlor crystal structure. So um, those experiments were performed at the ANCA synchrotron facility in Karlsruhe in Germany. And with X-ray absorption near edge structure, um, what we uh, were able to do is to look at the oxidation state of plutonium in those ceramics. And you can see here um, the Zane spectra, and this is a plutonium four plus nitrate, which was my starting material. I have another plutonium four plus solution as reference and a plutonium three plus solution. And these are the two plutonium pyrochlores I fabricated, the one with five and 10 more percent plutonium. And what you can see here is that the um, adsorption edge of these two plutonium pyrochlores is in accordance with the plutonium 4 plus solution and standard. So the valence states from um, the Zane's measurements at the plutonium L3 edge showed us that in both cases, so 5 and 10 mole percent plutonium loading of a pyrochlor waste form, we obtain plutonium in the oxidation state plus 4 which is a little surprising considering the fact that we were actually um, uh, performing all, temperate, uh, all sintering processes and calcination processes in reducing atmospheres. So to be more confident in those derived data, um, I performed bond valence sum calculations from the EXAS data and also those ones obtained um, uh, values of plus four for plutonium in both of the ceramics that I had fabricated. Um, to, have a um, to have a basically complete analysis of the system, we also performed Zane spectra at the zirconium K edge, and we obtained um, six fold coordinations of zirconium in all of the samples, which was not surprising at all, since the P site is six fold coordinated in a pyrochlor. In order to um, analyze the EXAFS data, you need to come up with a structural model of your plutonium pyrochlor to fit your data. And what we did is um, we built a structure where we set the plutonium, even though if it's a plutonium four, um, let's try to see um, if it's localized at the A site. And um, the A site, if you remember, is eightfold coordinated by these A, um, Y oxygens, which are a little bit closer to the um, plutonium cation and the X oxygen, six of the X oxygens, which are a little bit further, kind of these chair conformation, if you remember your sugar classes in chemistry. Um, and then what we did is we took plutonium, plutonium scattering into account and um, basically came up with all the coordination shells um, that would be surrounding the plutonium inside a pyrochlor crystal structure if it would be structurally uptaken on an A site. So here you can see the exafs of a plutonium pyrochlor, so the K3 weighted exafs in the K and R space. And what we observed is when we fitted our data um, with um, those models that we had a significant distortion of the direct plutonium environment, which is not too surprising given the fact that we have a, now an oxidation state plus three and also plutonium has a, a plus four on a usually plus three side um, because neodymium is plus three and also plutonium plus four and neodymium plus three are different in their um, ionic size. What we found is two different bond distances for plutonium and oxygen. And we found actually inverted bond distances for plutonium and the oxygen. So um, if you remember, the two oxygens that were um, in the beginning closer to, to our cation were now pushed further out. So we wanted to have definitely additional confirmation with a different method for these surprising results. So um, I asked my um, computational colleagues again, if they could help us out with ab initio DFT plus U calculations to um, derive plutonium solution energies in neodymium zircon oxide. So what we did is we derived those for plutonium three and plutonium four on the A and B side to just have a very um, holistic idea about all the solution energies and all the possible scenarios where plutonium could be uptaken. And we took plutonium oxygen uh, oxide as reference state 
um, for our reactants. And we found that actually the lowest solution energy was obtained for a plutonium-4 at the neodymium site. And due to the different oxidation states of neodymium and plutonium, we need to um, balance this via oxygen vacancies, um, via the introduction of oxygen vacancies. And also the bond distances for plutonium and oxygen were in very good con uh, agreement with the computationally derived methods. So that gave us um, confirmation of our experimentally derived data. And the last point that I would like to talk about on the waste forms is whenever we want to understand how a potential waste form would behave underground in case, you know, all the technical barriers would fail down here. Um, we can perform those experiments dissolution studies inside a laboratory and we can derive dissolution rates that will give us um, a capability or a possibility to extrapolate um, the dissolution rates of those materials under repository relevant conditions when we study the pH dependence, temperature dependence, and composition dependence. And what you can see here is that the dissolution rates are actually not going to drastically increase once we undergo this pyrochlor defect pyrite order disorder transition in um, as response to um, self irradiation of a potential waste form. And in collaboration with the University of Bremen and the Institut Chimie Séparation Marcoule in France, um, I performed also microscopic experiments to understand how this dissolution actually proceeds. And um, we could observe grain boundary opening due to dissolution of those materials. And with vertical scanning interferometry, we were able to understand that the main mechanism for the dissolution of those materials is the grain retreat itself. So the grains dissolving themselves. Okay, and um, the last study that's actually currently ongoing in combination or in collaboration with the um, Australian Nuclear and Science Technology um, organization is the irradiation of some of those specimens. So um, we do this for a zirconate sample and for a titanate sample. And the difference between zirconate and titanate pyrochlores is that titanate pyrochlores are actually known to undergo an amorphization when they get um, exposed to um, radiation. And what we did is we irradiated those two different ceramics, so a neodymium zirconate and an erbium titanate with helium ions to mimic alpha decay. And um, we performed or we prepared very thin samples and that allowed us to basically use our characterization techniques to analyze the radiation response in depth. So we damaged the entire material and we are currently in the process of um, evaluating our neutron diffraction data on these irradiated specimens. And we also have um, microscopic analysis with EBSD and TEM currently ongoing. And I just got an email actually before the meeting that um, they are measuring the TEM pattern of those specimens today in Australia. So that's pretty exciting. And we wanna understand then how these radiation damage or in, in a titanate or the order disorder transition is actually affecting the dissolution of those uh, behavior of those specimens because the dissolution uh, would happen worst case scenario again in a geological underground repository in case of fa uh, failure of all technical barriers. And um, one other experiment that we are planning is to um, fabricate a solid solution of a zirconate and titanate. And then um, in order to understand the driving forces of the um, radiation behavior, because we know those ones will undergo um, order disorder transitions, whereas these will undergo um, an amorphization process. So we are quite interested in understanding or learning what those solid solutions are actually going to do. Okay, so to sum this part up of my talk, um, I showed you that we um, are looking at this order disorder transitions, which we are expecting in case uh, as a result of self irradiation of potential nuclear waste forms for zirconate based pyrochlores. Um, we can actually structurally incorporate actinides um, for plutonium and curium. It's the A side of these pyrochlor samples. And we also could um, develop an improved understanding of the dissolution behavior. So not only rates, but we could also understand that the dissolution actually happens by the solution of the grains themselves. And that grain boundary dissolution is not the main mechanism. So now let's hop to the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle um, for the second half of the talk. And um, as you all know, U2 is used in nuclear power plants for um, 
electricity uh, generation or production and the advanced fuel campaign is looking for um, increasing the performance and safety of those fuels. So we need to develop um, suitable fabrication techniques to do this. And um, in my laboratories at UCI, we have a strong emphasis on the sol gel technique. So um, if we are thinking about the fabrication of precursors or UL2 ceramics, traditional grouts um, are utilizing powders where, um, which have um, certain benefits and disadvantages. And if we use a sol gel route, we are actually using a solution-based precursor so no powders and that minimizes dust formation and it's also feasible for um, fuel that contains plutonium and minor actinides as well as high temperature gas cooled reactor fuel fabrication and the only drawback is a pretty complex gel formulation. So the sol gel synthesis what you do is you actually fabricate those microspheres um, and it can be done for a lot of different chemical compositions and the beauty of this technique is that we can adjust the microspherical size from the micron to the millimeter level and we can actually um, homogeneously incorporate fine particles and infilter materials and we can also control a bunch of parameters like morphology and porosity of those spheres. So here's a schematic drawing. We have um, our acid deficient uranyl nitrate, we have urea and hexamethylene tetraamine which are our complexing and gelation agents. We have the solution that gets gets pumped to a heated gelation column. And here in this heated gelation column, actually a solidification of our liquid droplet occurs. And then we are collecting our microspheres. So how this is done, this is the setup, which we also just have completed at my laboratories in UCI. Um, in the cold, uranium gets complexed by urea. And once it hits the top of the gelation column, actually the reverse reaction occurs, followed by hydrolysis which causes the hexamethylene tetraamine to be protonated and finally to decompose where ammonia is released, which increases the pH in our droplet. And thus our liquid droplet solidifies while it's on its way down in the gelation column and we obtain the UO3 um, microspheres. And there's two different areas um, that I have studied for um, promising um, uh, to, to different areas for high performance fuels. Uh, that I would like to talk briefly about. One is um, adding an additional phase to uranium dioxide and um, the rationale behind it is to increase the thermal conductivity, which is one of the main drawbacks of uranium dioxide. And the other method is to add a dopant to the material to increase the grain size of our material to potentially slow down fish and gas release. So talking about um, a composite fuel, I have added molybdenum, which has a much larger thermal um, conductivity than uranium dioxide to um, a uranium dioxide pellet. And what we observed was a composite fuel with molybdenum islands in the uranium dioxide. And if you look at the thermal conductivity, dependent on the temperature, we observed a huge bump in the thermal conductivity for a molybdenum doped uranium dioxide potential fuel candidate. And in fact, we also observed already a bump in the thermal conductivity just for a purely uh, uranium dioxide specimen that um, is uh, fabricated from a sol gel precursor. And we are currently trying to understand where this bump in thermal conductivity comes from. For the other type of high performance fuels, um, where we are trying to increase the grain size, the rationale behind it is that uh, we elongate the diffusion pathway of fission gases to the grain boundaries, which have um, higher defect concentrations and therefore offer um, preferred escape routes for our fission gases. And how we are doing this is by um, infiltrating dopants like chromium, which is currently already applied um, in the adopt fuel from Westinghouse. And um, you can see that we obtain enlarged grains actually in the uranium dioxide, even though the chromium um, is volatized during, uh, most of the chromium is volatized during the sintering process. But therefore, um, this could be also beneficial since we then don't have to deal with any additional phase in our uranium dioxide fuel pellet anymore, but would still get the uh, enlarged grain sizes. Um, what we are trying currently is to dope those materials with manganese. So this is a computational study from Cooper et al. out of Los Alamos. And um, 
one of my graduate students is working on a DFT plus U um, approach of those materials where he's actually deriving U parameters for each oxidation state of the manganese as dopant. And um, we are trying to understand if the manganese is um, substituting uranium or if it's actually located at an interstitial site to gain a better understanding of these doped materials to see if those actually um, are um, enhancing the properties of fuel in terms of um, a slowdown of fission gas diffusion in these enlarged U2 grain sizes. So does this relate to the island of manganese that you were showing earlier? The, um, which? This was a different approach. This, know. you mean this one? Oh, that's, this was Molly, okay. This was Molly, yeah, those were two different concepts. So the concept here is that you add a second, one concept of enhancing the, um, basically the properties of the fuel is to add a second phase so that you could increase the thermal conductivity of the fuel. And this one is a different concept where we are trying to make the fuel safer by enlarging the grains um, as the ADOC fuel does from Westinghouse so that we elongate basically the diffusion pathway of fission gases to the grain boundaries and therefore um, hopefully slowing down um, the diffusion of fission gases overall so that they are not escaping the fuel and getting um, or accessing the uh, pellet fuel um, cladding gap and could potentially like um, cause a, a, a high buildup of the fission gases in the cladding and could cause like in the worst case scenario, a burst of our cladding material. So by some mechanism, the in, in incorporation of manganese into the crystal structure or as an interstitial is somehow promoting larger crystals, larger. Yeah, so Mm -hmm. So Cooper et al. predict that we basically increase the amount of uranium vacancies, and that's very dependent on the temperature, um, and um, that are basically the how the manganese is dissolved in the material is temperature dependent, and um, due to the increase of uranium vacancies, we can actually, due to the presence of the dopants, um, it is predicted that we are obtaining larger uranium dioxide grains but there is no experimental proof for this out there um, yet. So we are trying to bring experimental proof for manganese, which is supposed to be a superior dopant to chrome as it's supposed to um, enable the growth of even larger grains than chromium doped U2. But a similar phenomenon is absorbed with chromium too. Mm -hmm. And exactly. do we understand there why chromium is acting um, to increase the grain size? Um, yeah, so they also um, basically they, they describe in their paper that the dopant of chromium, um, the way chromium is um, accessing the uranium dioxide is basically that you're at a certain temperature, um, the solution mechanism changes, and you're basically increasing the vacancies of uranium and therefore um, what's happening is you're increasing the diffusion and thus basically um, allow for um, the growth of larger grains. I see. So a similar mechanism then might be valid here too with manganese. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They just, um, because we have different oxidation states um, that are capable with manganese, um, the computational methods at the moment predict that manganese would be even like more powerful or would like enable like the growth of even larger grains. The problems we are experimentally having is that manganese volatizes at even lower temperatures than chromium does. Um, so we are trying to um, play a few tricks at the moment to see if we are, can keep the manganese for long enough in the material to actually increase the grain growth. And we would not be very sad if it would be entirely volatized at the end when we have the fuel, because then we would not need to deal like with another element in a fuel, but then we would just have again uranium dioxide fuel. And why do the, the multiple oxidation states um, make a difference? Um, that seems to be, so as far as they are predicting it, um, is that depending on the oxidation state, like the um, solution mechanism of these dopants in the UO2 matrix differ. And some of them seem to be even more beneficial for enhancing the grain growth. So it will hop from one, manganese will hop from one oxidation state to another as 
the grains are growing. Is that what's happening? So during the basically um, like during the um, sintering process, right? Like when we are um, increasing the temperature, some of the oxidation states could be um, will be uh, preferentially uh, present compared to the other ones. I see. So the temperature ramp will control the distribution of oxidation states, and that's somehow playing a role in the number of vacancies that are present, which is, mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting. So, and chromium doesn't do that. It doesn't hop between oxidation states. So chromium also um, does that as, as far as I remember. Um, so this is really like the study of Cooper et al. So we are kind of <laughs> trying to expand the study and bring uh, experimental proof for it. Chromium also does it, but I think um, in different oxidation states. Um, so manganese has just more more oxidation states, right? Like manganese can can go from, if I recall correctly, like from um, plus two to plus seven, right? Mm. I think so. We have more capabilities for the manganese compared to the chromium. Very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I guess I was also ready to, to sum up. So um, I've shown you that the salt gel technique is a pretty versatile technique and it can be really tailored for a lot of different approaches that we are looking to uh, fabricate precursors for. And this can not only be utilized for uranium dioxide, there's, um, it can also be utilized, for example, for fabrication of catalysts. Um, and we are currently in the process of trying to understand and bringing experimental proof for these stoked uranium dioxide systems. Um, these spheres have actually also, we have um, fabricated um, titanate spheres um, for a project with Savannah River, where they are using them for um, decontamination purposes of wastewaters. And um, I'm just about to start a collaboration with PNNL where we are actually using um, this technique to fabricate microspheres uh, for blanket materials for fusion applications. And just like a very quick outlook on some other projects that my group is interested in and currently working on, um, but that were a little bit on hold due to COVID and shutdown of all the labs is uh, we had a couple of RTE proposals with the NSUF where we are looking into um, the characterization of um, fuel pellet cladding interactions in um, high burn-up uh, commercial fuels. So we have like, this is a high burn-up commercial fuel sample where we are combining EPMA and um, TM and STEM analysis to um, understand more um, about this uh, pellet cladding interaction layer in high burn-up fuels. And a second project um, that we are going to start is to study the effects of energy deposition on the thermal conductivity of uranium dioxide um, fuel pellets with negligible burn-up. So these are samples that were in the treat reactors where we basically have no burn-up and therefore we can separately study um, the effect that defects have on the thermal conductivity of uranium dioxide without the presence of fission gases or um, decay products. Yeah, and I would like to, um, there's a lot of people I would like to thank for my group and a lot of people that I used to work with in the past and still collaborate with. And um, yeah, I would like to thank you for having me and um, for joining to, to listen to our research. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for the talk that covered both the back end and the front end of the fuel cycle, really very interesting. What questions do we have from the audience? Okay, there was one in the chat, I guess, and it came in during um, the talk about if the new fuel will impact um, the fuel burn up or reprocessing if we want to go that way. Yeah, I guess um, whenever we are altering our fuel, we have to be aware of um, the consequences it will have. So we definitely, whenever we add like a second phase, so what we also have to take into consideration is we replace part of the FISA material with, for example, molybdenum. So that's not going to happen tomorrow, but this is our basically, um, this was research for the advanced fuel campaign where we were trying to see how, how much we could increase the um, thermal conductivity if we would dope you to with a second uh, phase, utilizing also these microspheres. Um, and yeah, and the reprocessing, 
I guess that would also have some effect, but I mean, whenever we are reprocessing, we are having already like a very complex material as the used fuel, right, which has not only UA2 anymore, but all the fission and decay products in it. So I can give you an exact answer to how much more complicated reprocessing would get whenever we start with a fuel that already has one more element in it. Maybe slightly, but I would say that's probably less of a concern than um, replacing part of the fissile material. So you mentioned that you, um, towards the end, you mentioned fabricating uh, particles for fusion applications. Mm -hmm. Is that for waste for actinide burning? Or can you talk more about that application? Um, yes, yeah, so that's actually just for, um, so this is for a breeder blanket material where we would, um, where we are basically trying um, to fabricate a material also for the tritium production. And we would just, we are at the moment um, trying to just basically to offer another um, precursor form um, with the microspherical feedstock um, by fabricating um, lithium aluminum oxides um, that could then be used as, um, as materials for the tritium production. But we are just, um, so we are about to, to kick this project off. <laughs> so this is really like an outlook. <laughs> I don't have any, any results I can share with you at the moment. The next and the time. concept is that the tritium would then be harvested from these alumina particles? From the lithium, yeah, from the lithium and the lithium aluminate particles. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. Let's see more questions. Any more questions from the audience? You can type them or you can um, go ahead and speak your questions. Well, I I have another, I have a lot of questions. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, <laughs> I had a question about the um, the, the enthalpy data that you showed earlier. Mm -hmm. um, does are you able to understand the relationship between the structure and the enthalpy um, of those states? Um, let me go back to it. So. Those ones, um, I mean, can you, can you? Yeah, so maybe I'm misunderstanding how this works, but in the, um, uh, you were talking about switching between um, different forms of the, the defect fluoride and the pyrofluor. And then, so when we look at this, um, at these plots, um, the defect fluoride is the red line, is that right, at the top? Yeah, so this is the defect fluoride, like the modeled one. So the black dots are the experimentally derived dots from uh, the high temperature solution calorimetry measurements. And then when we were trying to basically um, derive those uh, formation entropies with quasi-random structures, um, we would obtain these values for a defect fluoride and those ones for a vaporite. So actually we were trying to verify if what we had seen with the um, neutron diffraction and PDF analysis, um, if we could see any indication with a different method for this um, order disorder transition along different length scales. And what we did is um, we developed a two-state model that combines the vaporite and defect fluoride um, in the computational studies. And these are, um, is the dotted red line or dashed red line here. And this actually describes fairly well our experimental findings. So I guess we were able to see that or basically prove with the computational studies that there has to be some, even if we go from an ordered pyrochlor structure to a disordered fluoride, defect fluoride structure, there remains still some ordering at a higher level, um, which is the vaporite. And, and we can draw this conclusion from the enthalpy data. Why does the enthalpy data tell us that there's some remaining structure? 
because we could basically, so the, the first indication we got for it was actually in terms of laser, laser fluorescence spectroscopy measurements, um, where we saw some underlying, like some remaining um, uh, order in, um, in defect fluoride structures. And from, so basically the, the first indication or the first proof we got was with a PDF analysis of our um, neutron total scattering data. What we found that when we look at the um, diffuse scattering with the PDF, that at the local range, we can only describe our data with a Weberite structure. And then we went one step further and also studied the formation enthalpy of this order like the ordered structure, the pyrochlor to the disordered defect fluoride structure with the um, uh, calorimetry and um, described it also with computational models. So this was basically, this was not when we found um, or when we, when we were realizing this underlying uh, higher ordering, but this was a, a second proof for it basically, where we say that the formation enthalpy of um, these materials, of these disordered defect fluorides cannot be described with um, a pure defect fluoride structure or a pure Weberite structure. And they can only be described if we have a combined, a combination of this ordered and um, disordered structure. Oh, I see, interesting. Does that answer the question? I had missed that detail that we weren't able to perfectly match the data with either or that it had to be a combination. Thank you. All right, I should have done a, done a cleanup plot here. <laughs> thank you. So um, let's thank Dr. Finkelday one more time. Thank you very much for, you, for the talk. Okay, thank you for having me. <laughs> and see you all um, next Monday for, for next Monday's colloquium. Thanks for your attendance. And thank you again very much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, uh, I have one very quick question if there's time. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it's okay. I don't know the, the uh, colloquium schedule. I, um, it's up to you. Yeah, Sarah, it's up to you. I think some students need to log off now, but um, if you're available to stay for a few more questions after the colloquium, end, then that would be great. Yeah. Go ahead, Celine. Uh, my, my my question was about the synthesis. Um, so, what, what were the what were the sort of technical challenges in um, getting the synthesis to work? And then, what were also some like regulatory barriers towards getting there? And what was sort of the necessity to need to do it in the Netherlands versus doing it in LA? Okay. So, um, you mean the for the plutonium um, pyrochlor? Yes. So. Um, the challenge basically was that, um, so why I went to the Netherlands is because the Netherlands had plutonium nitrate, <laughs> which I would wanted to, to use as a starting material and they had the infrastructure. So the main reason for going there was really the accessibility of the material and the infrastructure availability. Um, so that's when I went there and actually this, we just published this study this year and I started this in my PhD. So it took overall, it took over seven years. So whenever you do something with plutonium, it just takes quite, quite a long time because um, once I had fabricated it, the problem was um, just, you know, you have between different countries, you have different agreements and it was just, we, we had to get export licenses from the Netherlands and import licenses from Germany. So it was just like all the bureaucracy that took years to take care of. Um, and I rescheduled my beam time so many times that I was very thankful. I, in the end, still was able to, to get it. So it was not like any, um, not for any scientific purpose that it took forever. It was just that we needed to, um, to get all the paperwork into place. And um, the challenges for the synthesis route were basically that um, you have to, um, whenever you work with plutonium, it um, in in this um, in in wet chemical form, you have to make sure that you avoid also plutonium polymerization, which can happen um, at um, certain pH values. And if you have too high uh, concentrations of plutonium in your solutions. So um, what I ended up doing is I wanted to co-precipitate my material, right? I had a neodymium nitrate, I had a zirconium oxydefluoride and a plutonium nitrate solution. Um, so what I did is I just started by 
precipitating neodymium and zirconium hydroxides and then added the plutonium um, later on in and in the end, I was able to basically acidify all the solutions, um, the, the neodymium nitrate and zirconium oxide chloride um, enough to add the plutonium and then really co-precipitate, right? Because the beauty of um, wet chemical approaches is that you are in theory capable of a homogeneous precursor at the atomistic level, um, or at the atomic level. And um, when you precipitate neodymium and zirconium hydroxides first, you might get like one precipitate and then you precipitate the plutonium and then kind of the, the advantage of um, a very homogeneous precursor um, might be done. So I had to tune a lot with the parameters, you know, with the acidification and um, the pH values and concentrations of the entire system to suppress um, plutonium polymerization. Got it. Um, thank, thank you for sharing. You're very welcome. I, I have also a question, sorry to play. Um, regarding the thermal conductivity that you measured uh, of uh, the oxide, you say, you mentioned before, maybe if I understood well, that you had uh, like a lower thermal conductivity in a certain, maybe with a certain synthesis. Uh, yes, I know it was with 10%. Uh, might be related to the like increase in density or uh, maybe due to the different, I don't know. Do you have yeah. a... mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, uh, do, you, do you think might there, I mean, there might be a reason for this increase in uh, thermal conductivity? Um, so what we did is um, I fabricated also uranium dioxide. So you only see um, some data here. And, but I also fabricated a uranium dioxide pellet from a powder um, precursor. And we obtained a lower thermal conductivity for that and compared this to literature data. And what I've done is I corrected the entire data to the same density, you know, that I basically, so the density is not the factor that causes the difference in our um, thermal conductivity from from a sol gel feedstock versus a powder feedstock. So we are still not completely sure uh, where exactly this is coming from. It was already observed from another group um, a few years ago, and they mentioned that the porosity in a sol gel um, derived pellet uh, is much more homogeneous than when you start from a powder. But I have not in the publication that's out there from this group, there is no evidence that this is um, was actually causing the increase in thermal conductivity. So we are still um, trying to understand this at the moment, but I would say we're able to exclude that, you know, that the density just of the pellets that we measured um, was, uh, causing the difference in um, in the thermal conductivity because we corrected um, for for those ones. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Like Ryan is Ryan. Did you have a question? Looks like you're still on. No, I was just wanting to listen to everyone else's. Nothing original over here. Okay. Thank you for the talk, though. I really appreciated it. Yeah, thank you. Much for the talk. It was very interesting. I will go reading your uh, your papers now. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for the talk. I was yeah, I was very very intrigued. Uh, very exciting work. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, if you have any questions, like feel free to to contact me at any point in time. So I guess. I was also asked to leave a copy of the slides, right, for Luca. So um, you you have my contact information. Yeah. Is it okay to distribute your slides? Um, yeah, I will. I will send them to you. I will just need to take one out, like one of the last ones from the Outlook, because um, INL does not want me to send those slides anywhere. I was allowed to show it, but. Um, I, I should not be leaving the slide somewhere. So I'll just take the Outlook slide out, but everything else I'll, I'll just send to you and you can distribute it. Okay, and it's okay to post your 
the video of your talk? Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Um, one one question for fun. Um, what what are the what are with these with these uh, with these samples? What um, what is the sample preparation like? Is it a powder or is it a crystal or? So, so these ones, the molybdenum dope QO2? Yeah. So those ones, actually, what I did is I also started from these microspheres. And in the first round, I actually destroyed the microspheres. So we, uh, we crushed them by milling them. And then we just um, mixed them with a the molybdenum powder um, and um, cold pressed a pellet out of those ones. And in the second step where we are currently as what we did is um, we used the microspheres and actually in the fabrication process. So um, what you can do is you can add a solid to um, your feedstock solution and um, therefore it will be incorporated into your, um, into your spheres. So let me see, I think I have one more slide where this is shown. Um, yeah, here. So you can probably see this one. So what we did is we actually um, added molybdenum powder to our feedstock. And this is just a calcine sphere. This is a cross section through a calcine sphere where you can see all the molybdenum distributed in it. And then what we can do is we can mix microspheres of different sizes and therefore get a very dense packing and then just um, fabricate a pellet by cold pressing and then um, sinter those materials. This did not lead to super high density. So at the moment, um, we are trying to hot press the material to get a very high density. So this is not like a cross section of a pellet. This is just of a single of those a single sphere of those microspheres. Cool, cool. Um, very, very awesome. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, sorry. I think I think it's time to adjourn. Thank you very much.